as, as for what the teachers are teaching them, I can only imagine that the teachers who are maybe more media savvy, more sort of career psychics and mediums are very aware of, uh, very aware of what's going on and very aware of what the tricks are, but it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to tell, but yes. I'm... I've heard it suggested that sometimes these um, rather lucrative acts that people put on of psychic um, mm. divination and things often start out as a kind of folie a deux, that, that, that somebody and his partner or his father or something um, kind of manage to convince each other that, that they can do something that they can't, and they sort of rev each other up. And then when they sort of realise that they're not quite as good as they thought, they kind of, each one tries to um, help the other one because they, in some sense, genuinely be believe it. Have you ever come across that? And are you talking about psychic performers? I think I'm talking about psychic performers who, 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 who actually use... use conjuring tricks and pretend that, that, that they're not, but still kind of half believe in that they really are psychic because mm. once they had a really good success which was a genuine accident or something and so they're, and, and they're encouraged by this folie a deux um, partnership mm. uh, and maybe, maybe the partner um, rigs it so that even the performer thinks he's getting hits which, he, which he's really not, that kind of thing. I, I think the more common route, I think there, there are two common routes, one is the magician who crosses over to the to the dark side, um, who knows what he's doing, but realizes there's more money to be made in in psychic readings than there is in doing tricks. We all know um, examples of that. We all know examples. <laughs> that there's plenty of that around. Yeah. The the other route, the, the sort of the you know the stage medium, going back to sort of you know Doris Stokes very famously, sort of normally from showbiz stock, um, have normally been taught the skills by people from that world that. You know, they just see it as part of performance, as part of show, uh, part of showbiz. Um, and again, I think those are skills that are then turned rather ugly. But that, you know, that that's a very common route as well. I think the uh, very rarely, I think, is there any real belief in it, other than the fact that if you are spending your life lying to people, how do you deal with that? Other than rationalise it in your own head after a while and decide, well. I do kind of believe in it, and I do believe that intuition, it may not be psychic, but I do believe that I'm intuitive and that maybe that does give me an insight and it comforts people. And you start to rationalise it and maybe create a sort of a loose belief around it that follows after the fact. But I, I think very few people get into it at that level from any kind of sincere yeah. beginnings. They do make a lot more money by pretending to be psychic than they do by... Uh, frankly admitting that they are conjurers. Yes, it's a, it's a huge racket. There's a very fine line uh, to be tread. I mean, in, in, in my world, I'm sort of, on the one hand, trying to create a, a magic illusion, on the other hand, wanting to be honest about it as well and kind of show people a bit of what it is. It's a difficult line to tread, and I think if you're, if you're morally really not too fussed about it, you know, the... the it comes down to, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the justification that psychics give is that, well, it comforts people. And my feeling on that is, well, if they're lies, who are you to decide that your lies are what people need to hear to comfort them? And I think it's a, it's a yeah. twisted, it's a twisted yes. logic. And I think that the reason is, you know, to, if, you know if you've lost somebody dear to you and, and I'm trampling all over those, those memories by telling you that they're here now saying this and that. I mean, that's none of it's none of my business. And if I'm just doing it because I can earn some money out of it. And, and when you watch these people at work, so much of it is, is ego. I mean, some of the, the mediums at these spiritual shows, especially the, the ones that aren't so good, they just look like second-rate stage hypnotists that you might see in a, in a pub or, you know, in Corfu yeah. or something. It's horrendous. Yeah. And it's, it's that I find really quite ugly. Michael Shermer, in one of his books, has a story about how he was... He was on stage with a medium who was calling up spirits and, and t talking to people about what their dead relatives said. And, and Shermer un unmasked it. He explained on stage about cold reading, told the audience how, how it was done. And afterwards, um, several people in the audience came up absolutely furious with him mm. because he had shattered their illusions. Mm. And, and they seemed... <sighs> It, it wasn't because he shattered other people's illusions, it was that he shattered theirs. I mean, somehow it was thought to be cruel mm. when people were deriving comfort and consolation from uh, being deceived in, in this way. It was cruel to break that deception. It, it's, a, it, it's, a question, it's a question of sensitivity, isn't it? I mean, I think, it's, I think in the bigger picture, it's crueler to be taken in by that deception. You know, it's crueler. Yeah. If, yeah, if you're somebody who has 
um, unknown cases of people that have, are, you know, have lost somebody, lost a child that's so dear to them, and they cannot get over the fact they've lost the child and become addicted to these these charlatans, you know, if yeah. you want a better word. And, and that, that, to me, is as cruel as it can be. Now, how you handle... I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a, as a, as a, a mission to you know, turn every believer into a non-believer. But I think it's, it's important to get that message out so people can take it on board and understand it and have more information, because if you have more information, you can make better decisions. Um, but on an individual basis, I think, yes, you have to be terribly sensitive in how you, how you handle that. And I think maybe sometimes in some desperate situations, you decide, well, maybe it's better left. Maybe that person should just have that, have that um, you know, illusion and live with it. I, 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 I don't know. I'm going to go to a seance where a medium will no doubt call up dead relatives of people mm. in the audience and things. And um, can you give me some tips to what, what, sort of, what to look out for, what kind of tricks um, to, to, be, to be aware of? Because I'm naive in this, I'm, I'm untrained, and it would be good to have, to have some sort of psychology to to wisdom mm. to, um, to look out for. I think you'll find it probably disappointingly transparent. I think with uh, spiritualist services, um, a big difference is that the, the medium doesn't really have to do any work because he's got a whole room of, of believers. And that's the difference. If you approach any psychic with any sort of scepticism, you'll see through pretty much all of it unless they happen to get lucky. You know, um, If you go there as a believer, of course you're going to want to make everything fit. And if you're going to a church service every Tuesday, or I think it's normally Tuesday they do these things on, and you're desperate, desperate, maybe this will be the week that that the medium will get in touch with Albert or whoever, you know, mm. whoever I've lost. You'll do everything to grab at it. So they don't have to really do a lot of work. And if it's, if it's um, something you also have to be aware of, if it's, if it's a group that, they're, that the medium is familiar with, he'll know a lot of their stories already. And a very common thing with TV psychics um, is that when the cameras are off, they have a chat with people in the audience and find out who wants, who would like yeah. someone to come, anybody uh, I should be looking at. as transparent as that, is it? I mean, they don't even have that, stooges in the audience to, to, no, well, to even what, do it themselves. What they often do is they bring their own clients with them. Uh, you know, they say, oh, oh come, along, come along to the filming because uh, I think something's really going to come through on that day. Oh, right. okay. Pick the ones that cry a lot okay. and bring them along on filming. But very commonly, before filming starts, they come out and have a chat with the audience because, they're, again, they're all believers. Is there anybody who's... You've, or you've lost someone who drowned, and okay, well, I'll, if anybody comes through that's drowned, I'll know that'll be for you. Okay, you know, so, okay. so much that work is it's done. It's just already. so easy, isn't it, when you think about it? Oh, it's yes. tremendous. Yeah. When, when you're then actually doing the... Um, when, when you're there and the, the thing is happening, the things to listen out for, the most co it varies from medium to medium, and they all have their different styles. The best ones just keep talking. They know the value of just really not stopping and just bulldozing over any response from the audience. Uh, the worst ones... Pause too pause much. The they, thought, yeah, yeah, they get in too much discussion. They're, they're found out. Um, it, it's creating the illusion to the whole room that the medium's hitting one thing after another. Whereas if you really pay attention to what the person's saying, very often you'll just see they look a bit bemused and a bit bewildered. That does tend to happen. Again, depends on the style of the medium. Um, the most common pattern is going to be throwing out a sort of a half statement, that kind of thing of, you know... Um, have you lost, uh, you know, maybe throwing out a name is the simplest thing. You know, I'm getting the name, getting the name Albert. Uh, does that mean anything? Can anybody find that for me? Albert, uh, someone over here? Or is it the lady over there? Then, you know, and then they, the person in the audience will supply the information back. Yes, that was my husband. Okay. And then you get the medium will add that information. Now she knows it's the husband, whereas it could have been anything. It could have been the name of the person in the audience, Albert. It could have been a friend of yours mm -hmm. in the audience. Mm -hmm. It could have been someone that died. It could have been anything. But now she knows it's the husband. She then feeds that back, or he feeds that back by saying, that's right, it's, it's your husband here, and he's telling me that, you know, you're a lovely wife, and, da -da -da, and moves on as if he'd said it was the husband itself, but yes. he hadn't. Yes. And that is a very common pattern all the way through. You get a statement that's made that's vague. I'm seeing something to do with uh, uh, an accident maybe involving water. You go... Yes, that's right. It, you know, when I was young, and he goes, "That's right." He's, he's showing me when you were a kid, and he's mm. saying that he was even even there. He was there looking after you even when that happened. And you're amazed that he's picked up on this memory. Or you say, "Yes, that's right. The dead person died uh, because of an accident in water." And then I'll say, "Yes, that's right." He's telling me that that's how he passed away, that he drowned. And I'll turn whatever you say. So I, I throw out some words. You give me the meaning, and then I c 